Good morning, everyone. This morning's first reading comes from the book of Job, chapter 42, verses 1 through 6 and 10 through 17. Job answered the Lord, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand things too wonderful to me, which I did not know. Hear, and I will speak. I will question you, and you declare to me. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes." And the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he had prayed for his friends. And the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Then there came to him all his brothers and sisters and all who had known him before. And they ate bread with him in his house. They showed him sympathy and comforted him for all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. And each of them gave him a piece of money and a gold ring. The Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. And he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 donkeys. He also had seven sons and three daughters. He named the first Jeremiah the second, Keziah, and the third, Karen Hapuk. In all the land, there were no women so beautiful as Job's daughters, and their father gave them an inheritance along with their brothers. After this, Job lived for 140 years and saw his children and his children's children's four generations. And Job died old and full of days. The second reading is from the book of Mark, chapter 10, verses 46 through 52. Jesus and his disciples came to Jericho. As he and his disciples and a a large crowd were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he cried out even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, Call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he is calling you. So throwing off his cloak, He sprang up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, My teacher, let me see again. Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and followed him on the way. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you. Such service. Let us pray. Gracious God, I ask that you come into this place and into our hearts where we know you already abide. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, Lord. Amen. Well, we have finally come to the end of Job's story. I'm sure many of you are happy about that. Uh, And if you're anything like me, the ending of Job maybe is a tough pill to swallow. We just made it through 42 chapters over the past few weeks. 
listening to stories of hardship and tragedy and difficulties and debate and back and forth conversation between Job and his friends and Job and God and shaking our fists along with Job at the injustices and the bad things that happen to really good people sometimes. And then we're left with this scant paragraph at the end of all of that that tries to just sort of tie everything up in a neat little bow, like a Disney movie proclaiming, Job lived happily ever after. And I just don't know if I buy that. Are we really supposed to believe that when uh, God blessed Job with new sons and daughters, that it would just make up for the sons and daughters who died a tragic death? Or or that by blessing him with more sheep and donkeys and oxen, that the pain of the tragedies he'd already endured would just be eased somehow? Well, if I'm being honest, this actually might be exactly the ending that we need. And I'll tell you what I mean. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but if I did ask for a show of hands, I'm sure that many of you would say, You have wrestled with God in your faith at times. You have wrestled with heartache and why bad things happen. I have a feeling if I asked, every hand would probably fly up. And we've talked before about how in this this sermon series, a few weeks ago even, we talked about that we humans are seeking meaning constantly. We want to know why things happen. We want to know they happen for a reason. And we're constantly asking, what could we have done differently? Why did this happen? What did I do to deserve this? We want answers because we want control. It is human nature. I mean, Job and his friends just spent basically 40 chapters trying to make sense of suffering. And it's no secret that many people have lost their faith because of it. They've lost their faith in God because they simply don't understand how God could allow so much suffering in the world, so much evil. Regardless of whether you've ever been through your own personal tragedies or not, many people have a hard time watching the news or looking at world events and not losing faith in this all-powerful, benevolent deity. How could these things happen if God exists? In the overwhelming majority of cases, people lose their faith in God because of horrific things that they don't understand. They lose their faith in God because of evil acts perpetrated on innocent people. They lose their faith because of atrocities, both man-made and in the natural world. They lose their faith because of a tragic loss of a loved one that just doesn't make sense. Harold Kushner wrote the book, When Bad Bad Things Happened to a Good Person. It's a book about Job, actually. And he writes that if there is interest in the book of Job today by people who are not biblical scholars, he can attribute it to two things, cancer and Adolf Hitler. We are constantly seeking meaning to answers, seeking to know why things happened. And I've shared with you some of my own story of being diagnosed with stage four cancer a little over a year ago. And let me tell you that meaning making and questioning is real. It's what we do when bad things happen. I couldn't believe this was happening to me. In my own Job moment, I remember sitting with friends, friends who were with me, just letting me be. And you remember that's how Job starts. After tragedy befalls him, his friends come and just sit with him in the silence because sometimes that's all that can happen. And then, again in my own Job moment, Things turn, right? And Job's friends then begin to try to explain to him why maybe this happened. And let me tell you, we all go through that. I received so much well-meaning advice from people, YouTube videos, uh, diet cures. I researched everything myself too, everything I could get my hands on about ovarian cancer, even while I tried not to look at the statistics or the prognosis. 
And I'm sure I've shared with you that it was about a week in when I was sitting on the couch, staring out the windows at the beautiful view, and I was a complete wreck, fear just oozing out of me. And I remember staring out those windows and thinking, okay, Sharla, you have two choices. You can sit here and be afraid, or you can trust. You see, fear drives out our ability to trust. Fear drives our need to control, which drives our need to know why. Fear says to us, this is all too much. This is overwhelming. I can't deal with this. Fear focuses on all the what ifs and the woulda, coulda, shouldas and the why. And our minds get so busy with fear that there's no room for trust. So I remember deciding right then that I was just going to lean into my faith even though it was shredded and thin, let me tell you. But lean into a trust that God would see me through this. I trusted in the promises of Scripture that God said he would go before us and behind us and beside us, that God would never leave me or forsake me. And I just believed that if God said he was beside me, before me, and behind me, that I would take him at his word. And I would meet God there. And let me tell you, I reminded God of that promise every single day. (laughs) You said you'd be here. You said I I could trust you. And I did that because the, the reality is that just because we trust God is with us doesn't mean we never have fear again. It doesn't mean that we never have grief or we never have days where we're just immobilized with pain or anxiety or anger. It just means that we get to make room for all of it. We get to have all the feels and leave room for God. And you know what? God showed up for me in countless ways. If you've ever been forced into a story that you never would have written for yourself, you know what I'm talking about. Somehow God just shows up. And it might just be in a cozy blanket that a neighbor drops off to you. It might be the personal email of somebody who can really help you with your insurance needs. It might be uh, a, a silly cat video that just makes you smile one day. The point is that God meets us where we are, and meeting God changes us. Meeting God sort of cracks us open in a new way. And I'm here to tell you that meeting God is very different than simply hearing about God. Job had certainly heard about God. And in this morning's reading, we we hear this again. By all we can gather uh, of Job, we know that he was a, a very devout man. He was a good man. But his response in the circumstances that he was going through changed dramatically when he actually met God through his time of suffering. And there's a point in the story when we actually see the crack in Job occur. See, God lets Job's friends drone on for a while about all the reasons that this may have happened, this and that, and all the ways they tried to just make Job feel better at first, and the times when they tried to figure out what he had done wrong, because surely he had sinned, they thought. Why else would all this tragedy have happened? And then eventually, God also lets Job rail at God in ways that, frankly, sort of bordered on blasphemy, some of the things he had to say. And finally, God is like, okay, enough. Out of the way, boys. And then God just takes it to another level. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth, God said? Have you commanded the sun to rise? Do you know the ordinances of heaven? Was it you who commands the eagle to fly? We heard this reading last week, and I love this whole section of Job, which is in chapter 38. I need this section of Job, where God is not being condescending by any means. He's not being vengeful here to Job. He's just simply pointing out the obvious. What do you know about anything? You understand nothing of my ways. 
my purposes. And it's right then, in this very vulnerable encounter with God, that Job is cracked open, humbled. I get it, he says. I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful which I did not know. I heard you, but now I see you, Job says. See, sometimes we have to get to the point where we understand that there are things we can never understand or explain. When we are in the thick of it and we don't understand it, but we see God, that's where the blessings happen. In our gospel reading this morning from Mark chapter 10, we heard about blind Bartimaeus. And Bartimaeus was screaming out for Jesus to come to him, kind of like me on the couch that morning staring out the window, just screaming for Jesus' presence. And the people are trying to shoo him away. Don't bother Jesus, you know, you're being too loud about this. But he won't take no for an answer. And finally, they bring him to Jesus who says to Bartimaeus, what do you want me to do for you? Now, that seems a little bit like a strange question for Jesus to ask. I mean, Bartimaeus is blind. He's screaming out for healing. It should seem obvious, I would think. But Jesus wants us to be transformed. He wants to change us. And the only way that can happen is when we are open and vulnerable and humble enough to let God in and let God's love flow for us. You know, the antidote to fear is love, right? I want you to let me see again, Bartimaeus says. And Jesus says, go. Your faith has made you well. Do you see what just happened there? When he acknowledged Jesus' power, Bartimaeus was healed. When Job acknowledged finally God's power, he was blessed. The reason I said that we have a choice between fear and trust is that fear locks our brains down and actually impairs our thinking. Grief does the same thing, by the way. Grief can put us in a permanent state of stress. These are normal consequences of suffering. And you guys, I get it. I understand that not everyone is going through a traumatic or or tragic experience right now. But maybe you can relate on some level. Maybe you've been through something in your life. You've had a, a breakup or seen a friendship fall apart or you lost a job or lost money or didn't make it on the team or get the girl. We've all been through things. And fear and grief come in all shapes and sizes. What we do with our fear and grief is what matters. It matters to our overall well-being. Acknowledging God's power even in this. Leaning into whatever frayed faith we might still have left allows blessings to flow. This is the whole gospel message after all. Allowing Jesus to just breathe new life into us when we think that all is lost. Even in this, Lord, even in this. We know that in God's perfect time, broken things do tend to heal. Painful experiences are blessed. Grief can turn into dancing. So don't waste these moments trying to understand the incomprehensible. Just trust that God is who God says he is. That God's promises of new life are for all who believe. And the letter to the Romans says, No one who believes in God will be put to shame. Everyone who calls on the name of God will be saved. Trust that. Trust it. Acknowledge God's power and trust that God will show up for you in ways too wonderful for you to know or understand. Now, we've just spent four weeks studying Job for answers to why people suffer. And the truth is that Job is not a story of our suffering. It's the story of God with us in our suffering. 
And that, as I said, is the entirety of the gospel message. God sent Jesus to show us how to live and how to love and how to access God in all things. Jesus said to his disciples after the resurrection, Behold, I am with you always till the end of the age. I don't think we will ever fully know why people suffer. Not on this side of the grave, anyway. We just can't understand it. We can't make sense of it, although we can come to some level of acceptance in suffering. But what I'm most in awe of is our strength. I know that we are stronger than we think we are. I'm in awe of our human resilience. And that is where I find God. If God is not present with us, how else do you explain our incredible capacity to just keep going? How do you explain the courage of a Holocaust victim who has the courage to start a new life again, to remarry and have children? How do you explain a 17-year-old's fighting spirit to thrive after an accident leaves him in a wheelchair for the rest of his life? How do the absolute grief-stricken go on living? How did, what was the motivation that made hospital nurses in New York City keep going during the pandemic day after day after day? and of neighbors to sit with us in our grief, and loved ones to dry our tears. They can do that. We can do that. Because God is present and at work in us. I can't explain suffering, but I can explain how we survive it. Thanks be to God. The blessing we receive when we meet God in the mess looks less like a Disney ending and more like flowers blooming in the cracks of a sidewalk. It may not take away our grief and our longing and our missing the hell out of the life we once had, but it is exactly the ending we need. I want to end this whole series this morning a little bit different than I normally would do. I want you to hear a song this morning, and I want this song to be our prayer this day. I've probably listened to this song over a hundred times over the past year and a half, and I want it to share with you because I think it perfectly sums up Job's journey, if you will, which is essentially the human journey of suffering, anguish, redemption, and blessing. And I invite you as you listen to it to just listen to the lyrics. Take them in. Let them settle in your heart, if you will. Take them to heart. If you aren't experiencing any challenges this morning, as I said, first of all, bless you. God love you. I'm so grateful for people who are not going through hard challenges because you keep the rest of the people buoyant and uplifted. But if that is you this morning, I invite you to just hear these words and offer them up to someone who is going through a hard time or hold on to them for yourself when circumstances change. I hope that as you listen to them, you're going to remember that it, you are going to be okay. And so let's just take these words in as our prayer this morning before our prayers of the people. My heart is breaking in a way I never thought it Take this heart and make it whole again